Let's get to some of the questions now that uh, showed up in the chat chat box. And and the first one I'll just go ahead and take. Um, is horse manure still used for growing mushrooms? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I don't know the the amount of it that's actually done in other states, but I know in, in New Jersey a lot of our horse manure, certainly if, if uh, horses have been bedded on straw, the um, – the, 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 the horse manure plus straw ends up uh, on, on mushroom farms. Now, that would not be the case with shavings because they don't prefer shavings uh, horse manure. But um, I don't know, uh, for Molly or, uh, or um, Jamie, could you respond to that? Are there, uh, is uh, horse manure goes to mushrooms in your states? Yes, on all levels. And yes, about the straw also. Uh, something about the mushrooms, they seem to really favor that straw. Uh, and they're quite specific about it down here to only accept the wheat straw. Uh, but yeah, the mushroom growing in, uh, on the wheat straw slash manure is definitely in use in this state. Okay. Okay, the, uh, the first question is, uh, what are some, uh, some horticultural options for composted horse manure? And I think um, maybe what's being referred to is, is uh, the use of composted horse manure on vegetable crops. I, th I think I'm reading that correctly. Um, are there, are there options, are there concerns about uh, the use of uh, composted horse manure on, uh, on, uh, on horticultural crops? I think just what we've mentioned about, you know, w with the vegetable crops, but that we've touched on that. If he needs more information, I recommend you go to that Dow AgroSciences. Um, but I don't know, I feel like, Molly, do you have any other ideas? No, I, I think that's uh, you know, that's a good one. I would um, have more research available, but it's going to be uh, the end of the summer, and I'm sure it will be posted on the Maryland Department of Ag site. I, I would think one of the, the, the issues is relates to um, um, direct food crops as well, that uh, when you're spreading uh, something that's not composted, there's concern about pathogen uh, and, food and food safety. So uh, I assume that's one thing the question was related to. What are some of the benefits of, uh, of composted horse manure on soil quality? Um, Steve, if you're there, I, I, I might, might direct that to you a little bit. I know you've done some work with composted horse manure on uh, effects on soil quality. Are you there? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Molly had touched on an awful lot of it in her presentation. Uh, those are the real key benefits, uh, increasing in the organic matter and the water holding capacity, um, as well as supplying and folks in the dairy industry have been doing it for a long time, uh, a kind of a residual type of fertilizer availability. Um, much, much of the uh, manure and the nutrients in the manure are in the organic form, and they, in order to go through those transformations to become plant available, it does take a good bit of time and, and some microorganisms to work on it. And so adding the compost and uh, the, the manure, for that matter, uh, kind of gives us a little bit of residual nitrogen that we get to take credit for in our future crops. So that, that's one of the really, another key benefit. Another question is, uh, what are some options for managing moisture in horse manure composting? And um, I, I know some, some things that I've seen is if, is if um, maybe you don't have good available, availability of water, maybe you're not near a, um, water hydrants or anything where you can easily e easily uh, apply water. Uh, what, are, what are some different options? Um, I could add to this just to be sure that your your pile is covered. We use, a, and I've seen it in other systems as well, you know, a greenhouse type cover. And it really, we have so much condensation from it that we actually have to have a biofilter pull some of it off. But if you're in a very dry area and you want that moisture to, you know, come back down through your compost, um, I would be aware of keeping a cover on it that offered some kind of a greenhouse effect. Okay, good. Um, next question, um, optimum temperatures for manure composting. I think uh, I look up and I think, Jamie, you just responded to this one on uh, in the chat box. Um, temperature range should be in the 110 to 150 degree range. Uh, any cooler and it won't work well, any hotter and the bacteria can be harmed. Is yeah, now, that uh, pretty much sum it up? Pretty much, although I have had people tell me that they cook it up past 160 degrees and it's great. So, uh, you know, it's, composting is a practice. 
Uh, and it's an interesting one. I know professional composters in Kentucky who have then come down to Florida and they told me they had to relearn completely. So kind of what works for me maybe won't work for you, but the general range is if you're looking at 110, if you're 130 to 150 pretty much is the sweet spot where you want to be um, while it's composting and then it will just naturally, the temperature will dissipate as the process finishes. Um, but as you're looking for high range temperatures, that's about, that's pretty much where you want to stay. Okay. And Jamie, I would agree with that. We do try to keep our compost um, 130, 135. It can get as high as 150, but it, it must remain there for three days is what I've always um, uh, heard if you do want, you know, to really be successful with pathogen kill or weed seed kill. Yeah, that, that, and actually that's a great point, Molly, because the three day is essential. It must maintain those temperatures for at least three days. And actually, uh, for the commercial composters down here, uh, they have to maintain those temperatures for 15 days, according to uh, the state uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, next question, and, and this, this is just kind of a teaching point here about what's the, why is airflow so important in horse manure composting? And I know some of you talked about that in your talks, but maybe just to reiterate that a bit. Why are we so focused on airflow? Uh, the biological process needs it to to continue. Yeah, it's, it's just like one ingredient in the cake, you know. That's just okay. something you got to have. Well, uh, composting is an aerobic process. So uh, to main pro uh, maintain proper, uh, proper oxygen levels in, in your pile, you're going to have to have some airflow. And the one thing I will say is that uh, maybe he's, maybe the question is being mentioned, um, you know, the reason you turn the pile is so that one part doesn't lose the aeration, you know, because the center of the pile will not get any aeration, which is why you turn it, so you get a more uniform, uniform composting. All right. Uh, how about the use of treated wood? And I think, uh, um, I think um, Jamie, you may have responded to this one as well, but um, any concerns about the use of treated wood in the building of compost bins? I said no, but Molly, do you have any ideas about that? No, I don't. I, I've never, I've never heard it being mentioned as a problem. I've never heard of any studies. Um, it's not to say that it wouldn't happen, but I, I know nothing about it in the eight years that I've been associated with this. Yeah, I have heard nothing about it. How about the transmission of disease vectors? And I'm, and I'm, my guess is the question may refer to uh, like vermin and things of that nature, uh, um, rodents. There is nothing that is going to survive in a composter that is running between 130 and 150. <laughs> That's three days. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. And it actually for people who have folds like rotococcus is a bacterial problem that can be in ground in your soils in Florida and it can be just a, a really insidious problem but uh, if you compost properly rotococcus should be killed um, it, it that those temperatures for that many days pretty much takes care of everything sure uh, how about grass clippings in a compost pile I, I know there's I know our state has some concerns about the use of grass clippings I think the larger composting it's operations it is allowed, um, but in but in small farm operations I think they suggest against it, although they don't ban it. I know that um, if not, and it, just, just any comments on that about using grass clippings? What are some? We don't perhaps? recommend it. Yeah, I was just going to say we don't recommend it only because it uh, is a very likely source of uh, herbicide contaminants. Sure. And also, it will increase uh, the bulk density. Now, when you're dealing about with stable waste, which can be so high, you know, shavings versus manure, you can probably get away with uh, grass clippings in there that's not going to um, ruin the recipe. But you just need to be very careful if it's if you're doing just manure and not the bedding that you add something else that's going to have a higher bulk density. And uh, another carbon source, perhaps perhaps, uh, as well. Right. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a comment, a great comment, though. Um, um, find your market or use of the material and then work backwards uh, to develop the system. And, uh, you know, I'm not 
sure exactly how you go through that, but if you know your market is a, a certain market, then you can kind of, uh, maybe that's a better approach to de determining the best way for, uh, for you to, to manage your compost. I think you put up a, somebody put up a, a website about um, Dow Sciences and the potential issues of and chlorpyrolid, uh, and that they apparently have a website that uh, relates to those. Um, if there is concern about uh, those those herbicides being an issue in uh, in compost, um, the, here, here's here's another another comment uh, question about neighbor guidelines for composting horse manure. Um, to get along with your neighbors, some you know some neighbors are, are opposed to really manure of any kind in any place. Um, What's the, what's the best way to work with your neighbors, especially when you're close to suburban neighbors? Like in our state, we have a, a lot of small farms that are close to close to lots of neighbors. I think you have to do a good job of your composting, uh, having it contained, whether it's in a concrete bunker, you know, having the cover. Again, I think education whether you want to be proactive and approach neighbors and tell them you're going to be doing this, of course, after you've got comments. <laughs> um, but just be, you know, be really proactive. And I think even offer to take them a load of the compost for their yard so that everybody realizes that what you're doing is a good thing. I, I agree with you, Molly. And actually, when I was at the Waste to Worth conference, we went to a farm that actually did that, and they had... People, people love gifts, and when you, you know, when you give good compost that can really grow things, that can help a long way. And, and it is it's just management, just like she said. Sure. Um, how about this? I think is more for you, Molly, because it came in while you were speaking. Um, someone asked about suggested. Uh, you suggest screening the compost material before use, after it comes out of that that uh, the compost process. Should it should it be screened? Right. Uh, you know, to be aware of what. It looks like, looks like when it comes out. There are some areas where there's going to be, you know, pharmaceutical tubes that came out in a, a stall that got cleaned, a butte tube or a worm paste tube or whatever. Obviously, that needs to be screened out. Um, if the manure balls have not been sufficiently broken up in the material, personally, I don't believe you're going to have a quality product if they haven't because of what they need to add to the, um, you know, to the compost. But those would need to be screened out uh, if you end up with, you know, if you get bulk shaving, sometimes you get a larger piece of wood that somehow manages to make it in there. Um, that getting screened out really is, if it's well mixed at the beginning, those pieces are going to be, you know, easily seen and easily gotten out. Uh, screening can be done very cheaply or very expensive. <laughs> uh, machines can do it. So. Here, here's a here's a great question. It's, this is our last question. It's a, but it's a great question, kind of coming from the small composter. That are there any? What do you what do you recommend in terms of kind of hands-on things without doing compost testing? Without uh, what are some? How do you determine quickly your moisture content? How do you determine the need for um, added nitrogen, added uh, carbon sources? Um, kind of quick ways you might do that uh, on the farm without doing any kind of extra testing. What would you look for visually, or, or is that not possible? Well, I say wrong out the sponge for the wetness. Um, okay. I would agree with Jamie. You know, the consistency, you certainly don't want it dusty. Uh, you also don't want it to, you know, stay as a snowball in your hand. It, it uh, you know, it has to... It has to land in the middle there, and, and doing it enough to learn what really, you know, looks good, smells good, feels good, I think is a matter of practice as much as anything else. Right, right. And, Mike, there are some really good kind of cheat sheets that allow you to estimate what the carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, is for certain materials that we're using, and uh, that's really simple math to calculate a ratio so you can get really close just by using some uh, book values for that kind of, uh, for those kind of materials. Okay. What about the squeeze test for qualitative uh, horse manure compost quality? And I, and I know I've done that to determine moisture content. You know, if it, 
doesn't drip water out of your hands, you, you, you figure you're not too far off. Um, so any, any, any other comments from any of our speakers? Great job on the questions. And yes, thank you very much. You can always contact us if you have further questions.